Hello everyone, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm an independent consultant, hands-on software architect, also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson number 85, we'll continue our journey of the architecture characteristics by defining scalability and elasticity. I'll show you the differences between these two and how they relate to various architecture styles, including monolithic architectures, event-driven, microservices, and space-based architecture. Scalability is defined as the ability of a system to remain responsive as user load or requests gradually increase over time, as you can see from this diagram. I'm showing it against users, but it could also be requests. What we're looking for in a scalable system is that through natural growth or additional features added to our system, that responsiveness remains the same or is not impacted as more users use the system. Now this is different than elasticity, which is the ability of a system to main, remain responsive during significantly high instantaneous spikes, usually unknown spikes in user load. Sometimes these are planned or known events. Sometimes they're not uh, events that can be planned. For example, uh, concert ticket systems are great examples of systems that require a high level of elasticity. You see, there's not many users when there's no concert advertised, but once a concert gets advertised, that's when that system gets hit. Um, auction systems like eBay is another good example of a system that requires elasticity and maybe also scalability, but specifically, towards the end of an auction is usually when we get high user volumes for the frantic bidding that occurs when the countdowns let that last five minutes. Uh, trading systems even have uh, needs for elasticity for various um, market situations or conditions that may occur, and even insurance systems uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, insurance companies also um, sometimes require elasticity, for example, for natural disasters that may occur. Uh, tornadoes, floods, hurricanes, and stuff like that, uh, the number of claims significantly increases, hence more use of the system. Now, it's kind of interesting. If we take a look at these four architecture styles, our monolithic architecture, and then the rest of the distributed architectures, event-driven microservices and space-based architecture, um, let me show you how these relate to scalability and elasticity. And again, I'm going to go into the details of each of these about the why piece. But monolithic architectures have fairly low levels of scalability and elasticity, and I'll show you why. Event-driven architectures do much better, but still not maximized. And again, I'll, we'll go into the details of event-driven, of why it's good, but not perfect. As a matter of fact, microservices, ooh, almost gets there in terms of being even better at scalability and elasticity, but it's still not quite there because nothing everyone can beat space-based architecture. It is built, it's the kind of architecture that we're gonna go through in a little bit here that maximizes scalability and elasticity. So let's take a look at the monolithic architectures first. Uh, things like, for example, the layered architecture, or maybe it's a modular monolith such as this one. Uh, could be pipeline or could be microkernel. Uh, let's use an example for all four of these architecture styles of four different versions of an electronics recycling application. And this is where you can go either through public or the kiosk to be able to recycle your old iPhone and maybe even get some money for it. And so the point is we've got all these portions of the application here, quoting item status, receiving of the device, assessing the device, and then accounting, recycling, and reporting. And the point is this. Can we scale out a monolith? Of course we can. Um, but the problem is uh, twofold. First of all, the only thing we really need to scale are the public facing portions of this, quoting an item status. But if we scale this out, meaning if we in add more instances of this application for kind of load balancing, the problem is we have to scale out all the other functionality, the receiving code, all the accounting logic, even the reporting logic. And this is not only expensive, but it's consuming resources unnecessarily. But it's not all the application because generally monolithic architectures correspondingly have a central monolithic database. And if they do, this also impacts scalability because as the application scales, so does the database. If we don't scale the database, it doesn't matter how many instances of this application is up. 
um, it will be the constraint of scalability and elasticity. Now, one of the other reasons why monolithic architecture styles generally are not suitable for elastic systems or even scalable systems is something called MTTS, the mean time to startup. When we start up a new instance of this application, um, how long does that take? And the MTTS for monolithic architectures is very, very high. As a matter of fact, perhaps the highest out of all the architecture styles, um, mostly due to the large application scope. Um, every piece of functionality has to start up. And we have to connect to the database as well. Um, we have to create object pools, connection pools, object instantiations. And this takes a long time. And so it's usually measured in a matter of minutes, which is why these are not suited at all for elastic systems, because we can't respond fast enough to the user load to just add another application. And don't forget about the database as well. So uh, the point is the MTTS is very high, and that's the reason why monolithic architectures, although we can scale them, uh, usually don't lend themselves towards scalability and elasticity. However, distributed architecture does. And let's take a look at the first one of these, event-driven architecture. Now, event-driven architecture, let's use the same application. This is the same re electronics recycling application. But now notice it's a distributed architecture where each of those portions of an application that it was is in its own event processor. Now I've shown here uh, two different databases. Um, sometimes in EDA, we're all sharing the same database. Sometimes we split it. But the point is we have shared data. So the reason why this gets good reviews for scalability and elasticity is that each event processor can scale independently. As a matter of fact, the cool thing is this is usually done programmatically, folks, which is fantastic. Um, but the problem is this. Um, oh, and also, by the way, before I forget, yes, the use of async mes messaging and queues um, is, gives us the ability to apply back pressure. So it increases our scalability and elasticity because not Every one of these event processors that's involved in the workflow of a transaction necessarily needs to scale the same. And the point is, if we've got background processors that can't keep up with demand, but our front end processors can, that queuing mechanism provides expansibility and the ability to apply back pressure. Problem though is um, the shared database impacts scalability because we can certainly scale these out, but we also have to correspondingly again tend to scale out the database as well. So um, it's one of just the things that plagues this. And as a result, um, mean time to startup and EDA, I really can't talk about in general terms like the other architecture styles because this can really vary based on the granularity of event processors. Um, some of these event processors may be small and quick startup. Some of them, uh, for example, like accounting, uh, may be so large that it takes a long time to start up. And as a result also, MTTS is also impacted in event-driven architecture because we've really got two things we're connecting to. We have to connect to a broker, which is pretty fast, but also we have to connect to the database as well for each of these processors every time we spin one up. So it's really hard to generically assess MTTS for event-driven architectures. Let's take a look now at microservices. Here's the same application kind of implemented differently or designed with microservices. Notice how I've identified the domains here, quoting, receiving, assessment, recycling, and reporting. Um, but here, now within quoting, I'm not having to scale the entire domain or service of quoting, but now I have function level scalability. So that allows me to vary the scalability across all of these services where it's only needed, which is much more cost effective, much more efficient, and also does not cons unnecessarily consume uh, valuable resources that I have for other services. As a matter of fact, I can scale the data independently from other services as well. And this is another very powerful feature of microservices, why it rates so high, as you can see, on scalability and elasticity. Now, the mean time to startup is very good, usually measured in seconds, by the way, due to the fine-grained nature of these services, their single purpose. 
However, it's not perfect yet because it's still impacted due to the database connection. And so, so this mean time to startup is usually in seconds, everyone. So, but we went from minutes down to seconds. But let me show you the best, and that is space-based architecture for scalability and elasticity. As a matter of fact, here's two different processing units, quoting and assessment. The reason why space-based architecture maximizes both of these architecture characteristics or illities is because it relies on, well, hence the name space-based, relies on a computer science term called tuple space, where it gets its actual name for space-based. Um, tuple space in computer science is defined as multiple parallel processors with shared memory. It's kind of how your hardware is working. Um, but we can apply it to software. You see, um, we get rid of the ultimate constraint of high scalability and high elasticity. And that's the database. And that's the whole idea of bit between tuple space. Now, uh, the idea here is that we don't have to scale the database. All we're scaling is the application in memory. However, but I scared a lot of you. No, there is a database right here, but here's what happens. All the interactions happen with the in-memory data grid. Now we have a background data writer, which is called a data pump, um, which then pumps the data, reads that data, and then updates the database eventually. So here's what happens. All the interactions, as you'll notice here on that quoting service, happen in that in-memory data grid. Now, when I add or update something, or maybe even remove something from that data grid, uh, the processing unit or service that was responsible for that sends that information asynchronously to the queue. The data writer picks it up and then updates that data. And that's kind of how space-based works. Um, right after this, I'm going to show you some resources, everybody, where you can get a lot more information about not only these characteristics, but also all of these architecture styles, including space-based architecture. So, the reason this gets such high ratings, the highest ratings, that each vent processor can scale independently. However, the key part is here that scalability and elasticity, folks, do not have a constraint. In other words, it doesn't have the constraint on the database. And so only, only with the in-memory data grid. Um, and so because of that, it's very fast. But also, the mean time to start up is extremely fast because we have separately deployed event processors and no database connection. The startup time here, folks, is usually a matter of milliseconds. And so that's great to be able to respond to that elasticity. However, the one constraint we do have, everybody, is that the mean time to startup can be impacted by two things. Every single processing unit here has to connect to the broker for a data pump. And so that's the first uh, time. Uh, the second is uh, the initial cache load. Now, when I say initial cache load, I mean not when we spin up instances. Spinning up additional instances relies on the, each other's in-memory data grid. So the point is I'm never reading from the database. But the initial startup of a particular processing unit does need to go to a data reader to be able to ask for all that data and load up its cache. And so um, for this reason, um, with service or space-based architecture, I usually like to always have at least one instance up because then the MTTS literally is in milliseconds of time. All right, let me show you some resources. Um, a book that I wrote with Neil Ford, Fundamentals of Software Architecture, uh, back in February of 2020. Um, we devote an entire chapter to each of these architecture styles, everybody. As a matter of fact, chapter 15 is the largest chapter, which happens to be about space-based architecture. Also, of course, for free is Software Architecture Monday. Every other Monday, I do lessons in software architecture. These are short um, five to 10 minute videos. I know this one's getting a little longer than 10 minutes, but <laughs> no more than 15. Some of them just can't fit all that information into 10 minutes. Um, and also uh, my live virtual training. If you go to the training link on my menu on developer to architect, and you can also actually just go straight to my virtual training schedule. I've included all these links in the landing page of this. Um, also, you can keep tabs uh, on a third way of just looking at my upcoming events page of where I'll be uh, giving different kinds of virtual trainings. And this is in areas of microservices, reactive architecture, and of course, areas in software architecture as well. Lots of really cool classes um, with a really neat platform uh, that does, does 
wonders for actually the virtual training, highly interactive as well. So, all right, so this has been Lesson 85, de Defining Scalability and Elasticity. Again, my name is Mark Richards. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, stay tuned uh, in two more Mondays for another free lesson, uh, number 86 in some aspect of software architecture. Um, stay safe, everyone. Bye-bye.